Though in theory they were distinct, the line between pirate and privateer was always blurry. Francis Drake, one of England's national heroes, would no doubt have been hanged as a pirate in Spain. And Captain Kidd, not one of England's national heroes, would have been spared the hangman had he kept to his original mission, hunting pirates in the Indian Ocean. But in practice, the line was even blurrier than this. Many captains switched back and forth, becoming pirates one minute and being privateers the next. Former pirates were quite useful as privateers, applying their skills toward a common enemy in time of war. Anxious countries routinely pardoned pirates whenever they became necessary, a tactic that extended far beyond the golden age of piracy. During the War of 1812, the U.S. government pardoned the notorious Louisiana pirate Jean Lafitte. Lafitte had been the scourge of coastal communities in the Mississippi Delta, and in 1814 was one of America's most wanted men. But when the British attacked New Orleans that winter, Lafitte offered his services to the fledgling Republic. He and his crew harassed the Royal Navy in January 1815, and he told Andrew Jackson where best to position his forces. When the time was right, Lafitte himself joined the American defenders with his pardon in tow. A century earlier, during piracy's golden age, the fact that pirates might one day become privateers frustrated efforts against them. The 1690s had witnessed some of the most concerted attempts to eliminate piracy, prompted above all by Henry Avery's seizure of the Ganges Sawai. Admiralty courts insisted upon an effectively limitless jurisdiction, claiming the right to hunt pirates any time, any place. But in 1701, the peace of Europe was shattered by a succession dispute in Spain. The Spanish king, Charles II, had died without a son, leaving the throne effectively vacant. Before his death, Charles had named Philip, the French Duke of Anjou, as his heir, but the duke was unacceptable to much of the rest of Europe. Philip was the grandson of the French king Louis XIV, and if he were to become king of both countries, France and Spain, his realm would become the most powerful country on earth. England declared war in 1701 to prevent this, launching what became known as the War of the Spanish Succession. It lasted 12 years, eventually ending in an exhausted peace in 1713. Philip of Anjou was recognized as King of Spain, but was forbidden from taking the French throne upon his grandfather's death. During the conflict, Britain relied on privateers to harass Spanish shipping in the Caribbean. This was why there was no attempt to suppress the flying gang in the Bahamas. Its members mostly attacked France and Spain, and while some pirates still attacked English vessels, the risk of alienating the flying gang was too great. But what made them useful at war was what made them a nuisance at peace. The Treaty of Utrecht ended pan-European conflict for a generation, settling more than simply the succession to the Spanish crown. For nearly two centuries, English, Dutch, and other European merchants sought access to the Spanish colonial market, its illegality providing an opening for pirates and privateers. But in 1713, the Spanish government opened its market, granting Britain the asiento, a right to import goods into Spanish possessions. British merchants who wished to sell goods in Cuba or Panama now had no need to deal with anyone operating on the wrong side of the law. Though some still chose to do so anyway, the net was tightening around illicit commerce in the Caribbean. The pirates who operated after 1713 were living on borrowed time. Though most of our most famous pirate captains sailed in the decade after Utrecht, the infrastructure that sustained piracy had developed before then. The safe harbor in Nassau, the flying gang's connections with corrupt merchants and officials, and the plunder that financed the construction and the repair of pirate ships all developed between 1700 or so and around 1713. A large number of the Golden Age pirate captains had been privateers, though we know little of the precise details. Benjamin Hornigold, Blackbeard, Charles Vane, and countless others once possessed letters of mark. They turned to piracy because stealing cargo, or in Hornigold's case, stealing and then selling cargo, was all that they knew how to do. Peace threatened to make them obsolete. But not every privateer turned to piracy to keep their jobs. 
Some became pirate hunters, sometimes attacking former allies. Some attempted both, with Benjamin Hornigold abandoning his life as a privateer to become a pirate, then to become a pirate hunter. In exchange for a pardon, Benjamin Hornigold betrayed the inner workings of the Flying Gang. Though he would be killed in a hurricane that swept the region in 1719, the underground network that sustained this cabal of corrupt merchants and pirates was broken. The most important privateer turned pirate hunter was a man named Woods Rogers. Rogers had been among the most renowned privateers of his age, attacking Spanish and French shipping all over the globe. In 1709, he rescued the maroon sailor Alexander Selkirk, who had lived alone for three years on a deserted island in the South Pacific. Selkirk's experience there would serve as the inspiration for Daniel Defoe's novel Robinson Crusoe, and his rescue by Rogers cemented both of their reputations. But when peace arrived in 1713, Woods Rogers threw in his lot with the British Empire. He secured a position as governor of the Bahamas, which was then a quasi-independent pirate republic. He arrived in 1718, armed with a battalion of British soldiers and a general amnesty for pirates, which was set to expire on November 5th of that year. Nearly every pirate in the Bahamas took this amnesty, including many who had no intention of actually abandoning their trade. But if they did, accepting amnesty would be used in court to demonstrate that they were never forced to become pirates, undercutting the central defense issued by many of those accused of this crime. Rogers sought to reform Nassau society, granting large tracts of land to any man who promised to plant sugar. In doing so, he hoped to turn the Bahamas into a legitimate slaveocracy like Jamaica, a Caribbean island whose trade in slaves by the early 18th century was supposedly so much more respectable than piracy. And he issued commissions to men like Hornigold, who hunted down the remaining pirates who called the Caribbean home. By 1723, when remaining pirates like Ned Lowe plundered just to survive, the Golden Age began coming to an end. There were no more safe ports, the underground pirate cartel had been crushed, and there was nowhere for pirates to go to drink and be merry. And in the Bahamas, the slogan, expelling pirates, restoring commerce, remains emblazoned upon its great seal.